Thank you for listening to the Patrick Ely podcast. This episode is for entertainment purposes only and is not medical or financial advice. I did a jujitsu tournament recently and like three weeks out, I got injured and then two weeks out, I got injured where I just really couldn't train. And I was in the middle of losing about 20 pounds over four and a half, five weeks. So it was a shitty situation because there's nothing better for losing extreme amounts of weight than training. Obviously, I have to eat really restrictively, kind of starve at certain points, but the caloric expenditure of training with my team is higher than just about anything I can do. But just because I got hurt and couldn't train didn't mean that I wasn't going to do the tournament. To be honest, I felt like the tournament it was that I should be able to beat whoever was put up against me, whether I was hurt or not. And as a martial artist, I don't like the idea of pulling out and making an excuse unless I literally can't walk onto the mat or into the ring. I think that's part of the deal is figuring out how to survive with the odds against you. If you've ever had street fights or that kind of shit in your real life, you know that most fights don't start off fair and they don't end fair. And the whole reason of learning self-defense is figuring out how to deal with these unfair situations. You're getting jumped by multiple people or somebody's attacking you with a weapon or you've already been hit. Or you already fought one person and now you got to fight their friends. So I had no intentions of pulling out or not making the weight. But I had to do something other than train to burn all the calories because I couldn't just starve myself and lose the weight I had left to go. So my girlfriend's dreams came true and... I committed to going to Bikram yoga with her, which she's been wanting me to do for forever. I was also running and all that regular cardio type shit, but one of my injuries is is my knee and the pounding and smashing my meniscus, just running miles, wasn't something I could just do every single day for hours and hours and hours. So the yoga is restorative and and non-impactful and in a lot of ways is rehabilitative. So if there was this form out there that would provide me with an intense workout, it made sense that I should do that. And so a month or so ago, maybe a little more now, I started going to hot yoga. And it was a great experience. I'm planning to keep doing it with some regularity. It was not all that people had told me it was going to be. People had told me it's this really hard workout. And you're really not working out that hard, at least with Bikram. You're doing uh, more intense moves a lot of times in like vinyasa flows. There's no downward dog. There's there's no... um, inversions, there's no supporting your upper body or your whole body with just your arms. But what you are doing is you're getting an incredibly thorough stretch through all of those important ranges of motion in your body. And you are having to work your core and balance and stabilize and do weight bearing with your lower body. The part that makes you feel exhausted is that You're in a room, it's either 95 or 105 degrees, maybe it's 110, I don't know. You're in this hot room and you're just purging all of your electrolytes. The classes last from, normal Bikram's 90, but they offer like more beginner classes or people on a tight schedule can do 60 minutes. So 60 minutes, 75 or 90 minutes in this really hot temperature going nonstop and you're not supposed to drink for the first part of it. You don't drink any any liquid. You're just flushing out all of your electrolytes. And that's a huge drain on the system that that requires some recovery. It just isn't recovery that 
causes your muscles to like adapt and, and improve cardiovascularly or, or aerobically, I should say, or like in terms of strength or explosion or, or volume, muscle size. And it's definitely meditative because the positions you're getting in are not easy, especially if you're new to it. And they're positions where you're intentionally supposed to progressively stretch harder and harder and harder as you keep doing it. And for someone like me who has some areas in my body where it's very tight, I'm really working, I'm, I'm sweating and pulling. So there's, it's exhausting, but it, it isn't the same type of workout as fighting somebody or most likely doing CrossFit unless you're like really shitty at CrossFit and don't work very hard. But people who are like working hard at CrossFit or training for hard triathlons, Bikram yoga is nowhere near that, but it is very hard. It's mentally more difficult than in my opinion, something like triathlon training or lifting weights. For me, it helped a lot because I wasn't needing to recover from hard training, real training. And so I was able to go do that pretty much every day and then also go run. And I made the weight. I won the tournament. All that worked out well. I enjoy the experience of the hot yoga. And because I happened to be there in this hot room for an extended period of time, it got me thinking what effect on like my heat shock proteins, my growth hormone and my immune system, what effect this hot yoga had because there's research right now circulating that being in a sauna for like 15 to 20 minutes improves all of those markers for human performance, well-being and longevity. While saunas and hot yoga and other uh, heat type treatments have been around for centuries, pop culture within America seems to have embraced this science star named Rhonda Patrick, who I believe is a doctor, but she's actually just a PhD. She's a researcher. Um, and, uh, she prevents things in a very stylish way, kind of the same as Josh Axe, where they, they make supplements sound amazing because on rats or you know, in a chemistry experiment, they have some sort of effect. But the reality is, is most of these things don't do nearly what a drug or a medication can do. And, and a lot of them, in the end, within a human's physiology and the number of cells that a human has, they, they don't do anything. They're inconsequential. They're a waste of time. But she expounds on how great they are, and she's constantly, similar to Joe Rogan, saying she has all sorts of problems, like a hypochondriac, if you will, and all of these supplements and activities make it better. And in her research, she points to studies that show that heat shock proteins by using saunas are in increased, and the body has all of these immuno, uh, immunopositive effects from adapting to the heat stress. In doing the Bikram yoga, I thought to myself, this has got to be the equivalent of when I go on a sauna for 15 or 20 minutes. And I don't do that often. I, I do a lot of things in my day, in my week to improve my recovery and my longevity. And if it was really convenient, I'd probably hop in a sauna several times a week. But in terms of the hierarchy, it usually is not something I take the time to do, even though I do have access to a sauna. This yoga was killing two birds with one stone, though, because I was rehabbing and stretching my body while I was there. And when I had my experience of the injury and not being able to train for my matches, it gave me an ability to burn some calories, too. I just would definitely not recommend doing Bikram if you're like overweight and you're trying to do something to burn a lot of calories. It's going to be a slow crawl. 
I'm not saying I don't recommend you do Bikram yoga or any yoga if you're overweight. I think it'd be great for your, your health, but just don't expect it to melt calories off of you. Over time with controlled eating, you could certainly lose a lot of weight. So anyway, I'm, I'm skeptical of, I'm skeptical of anything that Dr. Rhonda Patrick says, because first of all, she has Patrick in her name and I'm skeptical of anyone that has Patrick in their name. And second of all, from what I've learned about elite athletes, most of the stuff that nerds say is really important is not stuff athletes, elite athletes actually use. Like look at Conor McGregor, right? He hasn't been able to win a fight since he stopped training hard. And now he just does all this science stuff and he pedals his like stupid mountain bike on the road with, with no hands on his handlebars and wears like a heart monitor. When, you know, triathletes and, and guys who started high intensity training to develop world-class cardiovascular aerobic ability in the octagon like Nate Diaz just get on a road bike if they're riding on the road or get on their mountain bike if they're mountain biking and fucking ride for hours hard that's what actually creates the elite the elite shit not what nerds like to talk about is what's the best thing to do over an hour because most nerds are only going to work out for an hour and I'm being general. What I mean by that is most nerds, most people who aren't, aren't real, who aren't serious about this stuff are, are going to pick a, an amount of time out of their day they're willing to do something and then try to get the maximum out of that time. Whereas people who are really committed, people who are really in to whatever they're doing, they're going to tailor their life around doing whatever it takes to get really good. Now, I, I moved to Stockton and gave up my whole life, uh, a lot of a career I hated, so that I could put whatever amount of time Gracie Fighter put into training their world-class UFC fighters. Not that I would become a world-class UFC fighter, but I wanted to do the training that would, would uh, allow me to understand what that was and allow me to be the best that I could be. And I get out there, and I had been doing 60 to 90-minute martial arts training sessions my whole whole martial arts life and you know now now we train for two three four hours and then sometimes twice a day there's always training to be had and that's what it actually takes and i saw that and how much better i got than these guys who don't train that way and keep being told that they're they're tight when they're not as tight as they are and because they're on to Patrick, and I get it, because as a chiropractor, I used to sell people with fancy shit and claims all the time that wasn't going to be effective as a real medication or a real lifestyle change. And I was fixated on correcting basically like fake problems I had because I didn't want to deal with my, my real abuse and trauma and like mental shit. So I was focused on how many supplements I could take and what might help me be, you know, 0.2% body fat leaner rather than just like getting mental control of myself and, and eating properly and just being ripped, you know, um, I get it. I get the fixation and I, I get also being a nerd and liking numbers and, and liking doing things in a laboratory. The reality is though, the people at the top level are not really buying this shit because I was, doing the Bikram and I was getting these regular blasts of hot air for 60 to 90 minutes. I was curious how that lined up with her research. In my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this has got to be the equivalent of going in a sauna for 15 minutes. I get that the sauna is hotter, but you know, the body's calibration and on off switches uh, tend to work with, without that much nuance. Meaning if the core temperature of the body gets, too high, then it just starts doing stuff to cool it off. And it cools off until the core temperature is proper. It doesn't like cool off less hard if the temperature is only five degrees over what the core temperature is. No, it's trying to get back to homeostasis. So I start looking at research and 
you know, there's a uh, little to no real research on what happens to humans and their heat shock proteins when they go in saunas. I certainly wouldn't be uh, proclaiming the type of shit that she has proclaimed about saunas if it was for uh, you know, someone's actual health and performance versus YouTube views and podcast guest spots. Because all this stuff is on rats and it's, it's not really in a sauna. And maybe I'm missing a study, but I use PubMed, which is like the gold standard aggregator of real peer-reviewed research. And the only stuff I came up with that showed these true benefits of increasing like heat shock response and growth hormone response was, was in rats. And it wasn't a sauna. It was just with elevated temperature. I believe 108 degrees was like the, the newest, most, uh, most high quality study. And under that, and under the parameters of the research that is out there, going to Bikram would do the exact same thing. Most likely so it's sitting in a hot tub for an extended period of time, like 30, 40 minutes, a truly hot tub. But you know, if you're, you're hanging out outside in the summer or the winter and you've got a hot tub that really gets hot, you could get some health benefits by chilling in there and you know doing what you do. I'm not saying you should drink a beer because I would dehydrate you, but I know plenty of people like to drink while they're in a sauna. You know, Maybe you could just smoke a joint or take an edible or drink some water or some electrolytes while you're there. But under the, the parameters of the research that's been done, hot yoga, sauna, hot tub, going for a run in weather over 100 degrees in an Arizona or a Nevada or a Florida or a, a California at times would do the exact same thing. Now, people who are doing rigorous training, like my fighter friends, might be better uh, sitting in a sauna because they can do it for less time and they can get those benefits and they might be too tired to then go be doing yoga for an hour after doing six hours of martial arts training. That makes total sense. But for someone who lacks fitness and isn't doing enough exercise in the first place, it would be really uh, romantic. It would be exciting for you to say, oh, the sauna is going to increase my, my growth hormone and it's going to have all these great benefits for me. So I'm going to make time to do that. And you know what? I'm not going to go for my run because my run. No, you should definitely go for your run. You should not make an excuse to use a sauna if you're not doing the physical activity. What's great about the Bikram is you get the physical activity, you get restorative work, you get mobility training. If you sit at a desk all the time, you, you've, if you want to have like optimal health, you've got to do range of motion and mobility training and stretching. And then you get the benefits of the growth hormone and the heat shock protein and the immuno, uh, immuno responsive effects, like positive boost to your immune system. There has been a real study on Bikram yoga that looked at not only Bikram hot yoga, but looked at regular yoga and on humans after 12 sessions of yoga, there were adaptive. Um, and so this relates to the heat shock proteins, which cause your body to have a stress adaption response, which is good for your immune system and good for your cardiovascular system. There was an improvement doing hot yoga and it didn't work with non-hot yoga. And in both, it appeared that um, brain health and cardiovascular benefits did appear just by doing yoga. But the actual immune growth response came from doing the hot yoga. So it, it is more productive than just doing regular yoga if you're trying to hit all of these different parameters of therapies that you can do. Now, something that people should think about because they get confused and different companies that want to profit off of saunas and then like cryotherapy purposely don't explain this, but you want to look at heat, the sauna, yoga as something that is recovery based and ongoing. So just doing it when you're healthy will help your longevity, right? 
that that's what having healthy amounts of growth hormone really does is it helps you maintain your physical structure for longer. That's why people like Sylvester Stallone have attributed being able to look like he does into his 70s to not only consistently working out, but growth hormone, which has allowed him to maintain uh, the health of his tendons and ligaments and joints and muscles so that he can keep working out and give him the vitality to do so and give him the benefits from the working out. Whereas you take a normal 80 year old guy and he can do all the bench presses he wants. He's never going to build a significant chest. It's too late because he lacks in the testosterone and the growth hormone. So cryotherapy would be something where you're trying to intensely recover from something dramatic. Uh, the basic manifestation of how cry or the basic presentation, the basic presentation of how cryotherapy works is your body has to maintain a core temperature. So you get in a space that's really, really cold and you can accomplish the exact same thing with an ice bath. You get in there and all of a sudden the body starts freezing and it needs to take the warmer peripheral blood and it wants to put that in your organs. It wants to route it towards your core so you can maintain that core temperature. And in doing so, especially if you've had a fresh injury or you've just had a really intense workout and your body's broken down, you've got all sorts of inflammatory mediators and metabolic byproducts in the blood in your periphery. Like say you just did a huge arm workout or you're just fighting someone and took a lot of leg kicks. Uh, you've got all, all of that junk in your legs or your arms and it's going to take that warmer blood and bring it into your core and exchange it with the cooler core blood which will end up in the periphery. And by doing that, you filter out all of that nasty stuff and you recalibrate your body's uh, response to the stress, your, your body's recovery response. And so instead of f freaking out and causing too much inflammation in a place where, say, you took a lot of leg kicks, it just reassesses the situation and just adds more inflammation to where it needs, but not unnecessarily so. And we know that with chronic injury and stuff like that, the body will develop unnecessary amounts of inflammatory inflammatory markers, and that results in things like arthritis or delayed healing. So you want to use cold stuff when you've got to recover from an incident, and you want to use the hot stuff as ongoing wellness. Uh, it promotes circulation, it promotes growth hormone, it promotes the adaptations, it approaches, pro, uh, promotes the heat shock proteins and it also promotes your body's own regulation right like you know how a lot of overweight people for example or people who say that they uh have have thyroid issues or blood sugar issues will get really hot um and it's like only 90 degrees outside or 80 degrees and this is too hot for me and then they just start sweating and they're embarrassed and it's stressful well if you constantly put yourself in an uncomfortably hot position then your body adapts and doesn't freak out so much you don't sweat quite as much because it's used to maintaining your body in this extremely hot place, whether that be a sauna or a hot yoga room or the street while you're running midday in over a hundred degree temperature. So I just thought it was interesting because I had just assumed that the research that I kept hearing Rhonda Patrick talk about was done, you know, massively through university on a lot of humans where they were looking at heat shot proteins and growth hormone response and, and it's not. She just appears to have extrapolated most of the information from rat studies, which is great. Extrapolating information from rats works really well, to be honest. Um, but the way something in a controlled cage or a controlled test tube affects a rat is very different from the much more complex and robust human system. And that's okay. I think that moral of the story is it's good to get in something hot on a regular basis for an extended period of time. And it's probably good to uh, take things like ice baths with some regularity, especially if you are working out really, really hard. If you're not working out really, really hard, whatever's happening through cryotherapy or an ice bath is mostly in your head because there's nothing for that sort of immune slash stress response to be responding to without true, like being truly beat up. But back to the heat, you shouldn't feel like it's necessary to go get in a, a sauna 
And for most people, they would probably be more productive going to hot yoga where they're also getting the movement practice rather than just continuing to sit in the sauna. If you are somebody who's training really, really hard and just looking for some sort of easy benefit or easy way to get the benefits, the sauna might, might work well for you. What you definitely want to do with any of them is you want to make sure that you recover with electrolytes, that you recover, you rehydrate. You don't spend any time being drained like that. And while it might feel like you've worked out really hard at Bikram, don't give yourself so much credit. You actually haven't had that hard of a caloric workout. You've just purged yourself. And so the quicker you get that the fluid back in your body, the quicker you can know what your real weight is and realize you're not losing that much weight, but also the quicker you can really start recovering and get ready for your next workout. So be mindful of that hack. If you just try and sip some water and have a little snack right after you've done Bikram yoga, you're going to feel like you're having a hard time recovering. But it's just because your body's still waiting on you to supply it with more electrolytes. We're talking calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium. Sodium's a big one that people think they need to avoid. And then you've got like your trace ones like chloride and zinc. The big ones, potassium, magnesium, sodium, calcium, are what you want to focus on. And there are a lot of uh, low-calorie electrolyte replenishers that you can use. Or you can use something like a liquid IV if you're not overweight where it's got a little bit of sugar, but is probably slightly more effective at hydrating you. I thought all that was interesting. I thought I would share it. This podcast isn't a joke, even though I, I probably made a couple little jokes in it, but I'm really just talking about the research that I went through. And uh, I hope that it helps you in handling your own wellness, fitness, and recovery. Subscribe to the Patrick Ely Podcast on iTunes or Spotify. You can also check uh, versions of the episode out on YouTube. Some are in video, some are not. And you sub can subscribe to the Patrick Ely YouTube channel there too. Um, I don't put as much stuff on there. I just know that if you want as many people to hear your podcast as possible, it needs to be available on YouTube. And you can also check out my NFTs using my social media profile links um, for NFTs that both help rescue animals, dog shelters, and NFTs that support the podcast. They're on OpenSea. And like I said, the links are in my bios on my social media, like the link trees. Just click those and you can get right there. And then the links are also usually in the show episode notes. Thank you for supporting and I'll catch you later.